Good evening, Black Bill. <laughs> listen, apologies about the technical uh, difficulties, but uh, anyway, listen, thank you very much for coming along today to the very first uh, Play Black Bill talk uh, of 2022. It's good to be back again. My name is Alan Stewart, aka Main Meister on YouTube. Uh, so, yeah, I'm delighted to be along today. So, I'm just going to crack right on. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I'd like to welcome you to Play Blackpool and to our first panel of the day. Before I kick off, can I ask for a show of hands anyone who owned the Commodore Amiga and the NES Sega Mega Drive? There we go. Well, if you're really spoiled a Neo Geo, anyone? Hey! <laughs> 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 And secondly, can I ask all these guys to put a hand up? Um, who thinks that these are redundant systems lost in the midst of time? You've just pulled up. You've lost my punchline. Ah, think again. Anyway, guys, listen, I am delighted to welcome you to play Blackpool. Four people who have continued to not only support these systems, amongst others, but knock out a quality of software we thought simply impossible back in the day. So please put your hands together for Mr. Graham Cowie, Geezer Games. Daniel Crocker and Mike Tucker of Bitmark Games. Okay guys, well, just to kick things off, um, thanks very much for taking time to join us today. Could I ask you all just very briefly to give a little bit of an introduction and a flavour to what your background is? Definitely a technical issue there. Uh, yeah, so I'm uh, Graham, uh, Graham Cowie. Uh, I've got, uh, I suppose, slightly like, the developer studio at uh, Gazer Games. Um, I've made games for the Commodore Omega. Um, I've been down at pool oh, for five years now. Um, started off with doing ports, but I've got a new game just about to be released, uh, Devil's Temple. It's a bit of a take on Kung Fu Master. Um, and yeah, I just I, I, I love the platform, I love uh, making games, and um, yeah, that's, that's, that's me. Hi, my name's Daniel, Daniel Crocker. I'm from Wayne Studios. Uh, we primarily seem to be publishing Dreamcast games at the moment. Um, that's mainly because it was my favourite system, and a bunch of my friends made games for the Dreamcast, and I figured you know, it would be nice to be able to help get those games out to a wider audience and you know, get them to the people that really want to play them. And that's pretty much it. Oh, I'm Ali Lowe, or Alistair, Joe Name Ali. Uh, I work in game dev, like full time, I to do mobile stuff for Ninja Kiwi to work on uh, balloons and stuff. Uh, and then kind of quit during Covid to do retro stuff because I was really bored with my job and I like old retro stuff. And the technology was there for an artist such as myself to kind of do that now. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Mike Tucker. I've been in the industry since 95, so 27 years now, getting on a bit. Um, yeah, I formed Bitmap Bureau about seven years ago with uh, my colleague Matt Pope and we've been making uh, games for the Mega Drive, Dreamcast, Neo Geo, uh, well other platforms lined up, but uh, yeah, it's Ever Crisis was our first retro release and uh, recently we released Spike and Death on modern platforms, so that's also coming to Neo Geo shortly. And uh, yeah, we have a great time doing what we're doing and um, yeah, we hope you guys enjoy what we're doing too. <laughs> Thanks guys. So can I can ask you, what was your kind of first uh, 40 inch video games? Was it Space Invaders? Uh, was it Pong? And both like me. Um, and did you get much exposure to the arcades back in the day? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah, come. I suppose around about um, 13, I was sort of like meeting my grandparents who lived next to the, next to the seaside in Sunderland. And that's like, you know, like most seaside towns had sort of like arcades there. Um, and that was really me, my exposure to it, really, you know, just going to meet, going to meet grandparents every, every sort of chance I could get, really. But most of the time on the weekends, you know, my uh, mum would ship us off to meet grandparents and I'd then just walk down to the arcades and I'd just be there one day, you know, just playing you know, all the games I love, you know, like Bomb Jack and Rygar, um, and then later on, like, sort of, uh, 
I would run those, those, those types of games and uh, yeah, it was just a great time to, great, great time kind of to be around the arcades really. I, I miss them. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, my first introduction to gaming was a little bit unusual for my age. I'm, I'm in my early 30s. My first gaming system, if you can call it that, was the BBC Micro. Um, it was my cousin, my older cousin, who's about 10 years older, he had it, and he handed it down to me, and he was like, yeah, you've got to make games, because there aren't any included. <laughs> so, made some games, played them, copied a bunch out of various manuals and whatnot, magazines, um, and then finally got into the sort of 16-bit Mega Drive Super Nintendo era, about 10 years after those came out. So I've always been late to the party, um, and that's why I think we're sort of starting to get into the Dreamcast now, 20 years after its demise. Uh, as for our case, unfortunately, they, they, by the time I came along, they weren't really what they used to be. Uh, luckily that's changing now. Uh, plenty of awesome places like Arcade Club, uh, and there's a few here as well. Cool. Yeah, so I'm like, uh, we were born in 91, so the same age as Sonic. Uh, so, so uh, Dan, um, yeah, didn't grow up with the arcades the way that people remember from the 80s. Uh, and I, I just remember them being very expensive compared to what you could do at home. Because uh, I, I liked the NES and I had a Amiga and BBC Micros and stuff in school. Uh, but the NES was the one that I really liked because it was, it, they were just simple games. Uh, that you could have big adventures in them, and uh, I'm also really dyslexic, it. So uh, there, there wasn't any, like, much reading in any of the NES games, which I liked as a thing. Uh, and, and then like game development stuff, I uh, found uh, the Games Factory. That's kind of how I got into uh, game development. Probably it's like found in a bargain bin at like, Toys R Us. All these things that don't exist anymore. <laughs> uh, so. You yeah, I was quite lucky that uh, when I was growing up, uh, it was yeah, the 80s and 90s, the golden era of the arcades, I'd say. Um, my first arcade memory was, uh, I think it's a fish and chip shop in Cornwall, where they had um, Xevious and Nemesis lined up next to each other, so um, that just got me hooked on video games and uh, shoot ups especially. Um, and then uh, at school I met, um, I grew up in the council state, so there was, there was various kids who had various computers, so one of them. Someone had the ZX Spectrum, someone had like a Commodore 64, then there was some posh kid with groups in Micro as well, so we used to go around each other's houses and just uh, exchange games and play games, and uh, yeah, it was great times really, and yeah, I spent a lot of time in the arcades in the uh, 90s in particular, playing with Street Fighter, um, Crank beat me on Street Fighter yesterday, so I'm yeah. <laughs> not, not that good anymore. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I've got very hooks on racing games as well, Ridge Racer, Daytona, Initial D, Sega Rally, um, and I still collect arcade boards and caps now. Um, a bit lucky we've got a warehouse to put them in. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's um, very hobby, a no, very difficult hobby to get into um, with the expense and the space that you need. Can I ask you guys? Why would you code for old systems when you've got like power behemoths like the PC, PlayStation 5, get, get up and also Xbox? What is the appeal of programming for extremely limited um, technically uh, hardware? What is the appeal? I think I just love it too much. <laughs> um, I think with the modern platforms, the, the, you know, you, you've sort of like lost that. Um, that boundary of what what's possible um, with with like main games, you know. I, I look at like PS5 games now, and go like, you know, that could almost be real, you know, in a few in a few years' time. Where with the likes of you know when you had a Spectrum or um, an Amiga, you, you knew what the limitations were of the game, and you sort of, like you sort of appreciated that. So when you're seeing games, you know, when it came out in the Amiga, like the likes of Shadow of the Beast, you know, you you knew that that was just blown would run up all people's minds really, you know, and people appreciated that. Certainly for me, I, I appreciated that, that technical limitation um, that, the, that, the programmers had, that the programmers had done. Um, and, that, and that's the appeal for me, I, I like working under those, under those limitations because I think, you know, for people like, people in the community, they, they appreciate those, 
what, what can be done with the platform. You know, it, it has limitations, but I think that's good. Good answer. It's hard to quantify for me. Um, because the Dreamcast is my chosen system, and I'm whilst I do program, I haven't personally been involved in the programming of any of the games that we've published. They've all been uh, programmed by friends of mine. So, I can't really answer in the same way, but I can answer why we chose the Dreamcast. There's a couple of reasons. One is that it's my favourite system. It's the system that I was the most excited about when, when it first sort of was being advertised. Um, I wasn't able to afford it at the time, being from a family that couldn't justify such things. Um, but when I did finally get it, it was kind of for the home scene. It was, it was the indie games that were coming out pretty thick and fast around, um, say, the mid-2000s, sort of like 2005, 2006. Um, and I made a lot of friends online who were making these games. And the common complaint was, you know, we're making these games and most people that play them are really happy with them, but not enough people know about them. And we just really want to get that you know, information out there that these exist and that you can play them and that they're, they're worth your time, essentially. So that's kind of how I got into it. Not from a programming background, but from a... Uh, I, I guess you could say marketing, but it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't sound as genuine as I really want it to, to sound. You know, it's, it's because I really want these games out there and I want people to play them. And that's why we're here today, showing them all off, you can play them all. Um, if there's any games that we have that are not on display, we'll happily put them on as well. It's, uh, it's just about getting it out there. Questions? Uh, why, why are we doing this? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a, a few reasons. One, I was like really poor and stuff, where I was just going around car books and like, collecting, picking up games. Uh, so I just had a big bunch of sort of retro stuff, like before it was cool, but sort of in the mainstream. Uh, and then, yeah, I always wanted to make games like that, but we kept all the good about making games. Uh, then did get in, I looked at games at university and stuff. Uh, and in like 2008, maybe, uh, someone told me about uh, D-Pad Hero. And I was like, well, someone made a new game for the NES. That was, I think, my first, like, the first time I'd ever heard of a new thing for a new console. Uh, and then me and my mate, he had like a bunch of like second set of dev, dev kits and stuff. I'm like, well, that's cool. Uh, so we, we made a couple of like, prototypes. I was lucky that my flatmates were into that and stuff as so, well. Uh, and then it was years later when Nest Maker came out back and like, got on to it and stuff. Uh, I suppose the, the reason that I do the old stuff is like, it's, it is a niche, and if you're doing something like Kickstarter, like, it's more likely to get funded than a, a game for a new system. Uh, because there's like, a group of people all buy basically everything that comes out, <laughs> whether it's good or not. But yeah, I, I, I think my games are actually good. But <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, that's how it is. Um, yeah, so for me, I, th I think from the PS3 era onwards, I, I've kind of lost interest in, in consoles, and they're essentially just PCs in different shaped boxes. And um, I think when you look back at a Mega Drive game or a PlayStation 1 game or a Commodore 64 game, you can look at a screenshot, you know exact, exactly what which system it is, even from the soundtrack, you know, you know what um, you know what game the platform is on. So um, the Mega Drive in particular has a real aesthetic to it with its 9-bit um, you know, uh, palettes and uh, the FM sound chip. Uh, so, and yeah, it was the machine that I got most attached to as a kid um, when I got it as a 13-year-old. So, um, yeah, uh, it was actually, I think, Matt Phillips really, he, he made the going tank uh, using the... I know, oh, you wrote that himself, but um, it was... Uh, there's a system called the SGDK which allows you to quite easily develop games for far so easily, but which is a nice head start with making games for the Mega Drive. So, um, yeah, that was the reason we wanted to have, you know, have a go at making a Mega Drive game. And um, we teamed up with Hank Neagle, the uh, legendary Mega Pixel artist, and uh, this crazy Swedish guy called uh, Daniel Carlin, otherwise known as Sam Schroeding. And uh, yeah, we got together and we just wanted to make the best Mega Drive game we could in you know, 32 megabits, and I think we did a pretty good job. But, um, yeah, it's, it's fun working with those restrictions. And actually, I, I think um, <clears throat> when, if you're developing a game for a modern system, there's no restrictions at all in terms of memory or CPU or colours. So um, I, I think working 
Yeah, like that. That's, for example, with a, with a Mega Drive, um, it helps you hone in on um, like things like tile sizes, sprite sizes. So um, I, I see this as a positive thing. And, uh, yeah, they're, they're a real choice work. On. I think I thought of another thing, another reason why I did this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's been, again, because I'm really cheap, uh, but I never had a good enough PC to run anything that would run on the new stuff. Uh, so I built stuff that run from my piece of shit PC. Sorry, I'm not <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, so that, that uh, how I did like, the, the uh, low poly like, stuff for modern games. And then mobile was at the stage when I made the industry that it was kind of that kind of like, PS, between PS1 and PS2. Uh, like low quality thing, and I really got good at optimizing that. That's kind of moved on, and I kind of miss those days <laughs> where, yeah, the dinner was much better. I think what you guys kind of touched on the, the beauty of like older games. I mean, nowadays you, you, you load up a game in PlayStation 5, and everything is just laid out for you. It's, it's almost like uh, an interactive movie, but back then you had to visualize. In fact, I was listening to a podcast actually, uh, and we talked to a guy who worked for Bally Midway. And he did all the side art, and he said it was his job to actually convince the, the consumer that what they were playing was actually you were playing as a space alien trying to shoot, whereas the reality was you were playing as a block, hitting another block up the screen, sort of thing. But that's, you know, and nowadays I think you just we've lost that. It's, it's just the rise and blaze over. So, what, uh, what challenges do you guys have when you're programming for sort of limited uh, hardware? And how many people are generally involved in putting a game together? So yeah, generally our teams are about three or four people, um, and they, our games take about eighteen months, two years. Um, so yeah, same uh, crisis we had. Yeah, people, uh, Catherine Monabdo did cutscenes. Uh, Savage Regime on audio, um, myself and Matt on programming, so yeah, quite a small team really. Uh, but we're finding now that the game's getting bigger, more complex, and trying to hire more people. Uh, so it's, um, it's getting expensive, um, <laughs> and then each game becomes more of a gamble, of course. Um, so what was the, what was the question? <laughs> what, what, what challenges do you find for challenges and how many in a team? Yeah, so challenge wise, um, it's more about. Uh, pushing everything to the screen in time. So you have, you've got a split second to push all the tiles and sprites um, yeah, into the right bit of memory. Um, and yeah, on the main drive you get, Matt's going to kill me every bit this wrong. Uh, I think it's like 80, 80 sprites, I think. It's just 16 by 16 tiles, or uh, 8 by 8 tiles. Um, and yeah, you have to be, um, you have to make sure we don't have too many per line, for example. I'll just try to get uh, Flicker, which I quite like actually, it's a nice characteristic of old consoles. Um, yeah, the Neo, the Neo Geo doesn't have quite, um, quite the same issues, but there are still restrictions. Um, interestingly, uh, you can't scale upwards on the Neo Geo, you can only scale down. So, um, and you can't rotate either, so, <coughs> so yeah, I think, um, yeah, if you look at the snares, yeah, they can, they can do, do rotation and full transparency. Um, each console has got its own little foibles and uh, traits and characteristics. characteristics. Um, so, it all, yeah, an interesting challenge uh, to work with. I'm sure same about the NES. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. no, exactly the same thing. It's a, it's a set of blocks, that's really good. But on the NES, it's a bit weird because like, they, people keep inventing like, new mapper boards, uh, which have like, new capabilities that the old ones didn't. So, you can have more colours. Uh, like, CD audio on, on an NS carpet, like, <laughs> how does this work? Uh, and there's a part of me that's like, oh, that's really cool, and there's a part of me that's like, oh, that kind of just wants to be a bit more faithful. Uh, but they're all really exciting. Uh, but uh, I do enjoy the limitation of it. Uh, as an artist, I, I kind of say it's like, uh, if you're working with cheap oil pastels on a canvas, on a bit of paper, uh, you know when you're done because it, it just doesn't take any more. Like, you, you throw stuff into like, it, it stops running, or uh, like you've run the colours of pixels or whatever, you know, like it's done, the memory's gone. <laughs> I like that as a good stopping point, because on the new console you'd be like, oh, you just add more polish here, more polish, and the, the polish stage of games is what I absolutely hate. I like doing like dirty prototypes and, and getting, getting out as quickly as possible, just making it fun. Uh, most Dreamcast games that we've worked on, they've been developed um, 
all the graphics have been done and all the audio, everything has been done pretty much by one person. And I think that, in most cases, how a lot of these games are uh, made, right? It's, it's one person with a passion and a lot of time. Um, and, you know, a lot of the time they take years to make. Um, but that, that, that's a good thing, because it means a lot of care and attention has been put into it. Um, on the Dreamcast side, I can't really talk about the programming too much, not being a Dreamcast programmer myself. Um, the production, the PR, the um, manufacturing, all that stuff, that's me. Um, but the biggest limitation with the Dreamcast is the fact that if you was to code for it with no sort of SDK, it would be incredibly difficult. Uh, and I don't think I've ever heard of anyone doing that. I mean, I'm sure someone could correct me if anyone has, but um, I don't know if anyone has done that. And obviously, for fairly obvious reasons, you can't use the Sega SDK, they frown down upon that. So you have to rely on someone else or yourself building, essentially, a software development kit uh, from scratch for that. And that's the biggest uh, difficulty there. Yeah, we rely on the community a lot. <laughs> yes, yeah, we're a good stick. Um, yeah, on the, on the Amiga, pretty, pretty similar sort of thing, but what, what I'd expand on on, on the Amiga platform, it's, it's changed hands quite a lot, quite a lot of times, um, and you know, the, the, the part, from a programmer's perspective, um, doing assembler, you get quite a lot of, um, certainly do, at the minute when we're testing the game, you know, these hardware expansions that have been effectively bolted onto the Amiga, and you'll find that your game won't work, so it's doing that testing. Um, against all those different, uh, different uh, you know, add-ons effectively, and just trying to find the line of like, like what's enough testing, and um, that, that's uh, that's enough before you release the game. I, I think the other thing with the Amiga as well, and I, I don't know whether it's like this on the Dreamcast and the Neo Geo and the Mega Drive, um, but there's a fine balance between CPU and memory, and um, you can get that trade-off. Um, so if you for example, if you want to use like the Leaf Blitz um, on the on, on the Amiga, you, you know you can get a bit of, you can get a bit of faster CPU, but you you you're choosing the memory. And so it's, the, putting these putting these up for these old systems, it's all about the, certainly for me, it's all about the trade-off um, of, of what of what we do. But I think what one of the things that's massively improved, and you know, it's just which way it is, is that we've just got much better tools than. Than we did, you know, back in back in the day, you know, there's some awesome tools to help you get in the in the making games, and it's just much much faster. And um, you know, like to win your way or the emulation that type of thing, you know, it can just makes things mad if you develop games. I did actually prepare some uh, footage of these guys' games, but we we don't have a laptop to run. <laughs> <laughs> but we're well up on spit slots, so thanks very much. Um, Question in particular for you, Graham. Uh, most of your recent games have all been arcade conversions uh, of uh, Ball Jack, Super Sprint, Rygar, and uh, most recently uh, Kung Fu Master meets uh, Vigilante game called uh, Devil's Temple. Um, why the Amiga? What factors led to you in these particular games? Are these particular favourites, including the Chip Shop? Um, yeah, pretty much. Um, I was at the arcade club last night and um, I was I pretty much just made a beeline for, for Bomb Jack because um, that's what I used to play when, you know, as I mentioned earlier, when I, was, um, when I used to go to the arcades in, in Seaburn and Sunderland, you know, I'd, I'd spend, a lot of, spend a lot of those big 10 pences on Bomb Jack um, and, you know, get, get a decent score. Um, and I think with Rymar, what it, what it was was that I, might have just been a timing thing, but I remember that coming into the arcade at the time, and there was nothing else quite like it. Um, that, that game has a beautiful parallax scrolling, um, and I don't recall seeing any other game like it at the time. I've not, I've not actually looked on you know, the, the name database and gone through the games, but you know, I remember seeing it and thought that looks absolutely a, an, an awesome game. Um, and it was just, it was just sort of like I, I kind, of, kind of just loved it. Which way it looks. Um, it was a brutally hard game. Um, you know, you put 10 pence in, and that, you know, maybe it's like a 13, 14 year old, I wouldn't last very long. Um, but I did see somebody, um, you know, when you when the arcades, you know, you get a crowd around here, so you thought, oh, somebody's 
something's going on. And I watched I watched the guy complete you know complete the game like all 27 levels. And I see you were able to see uh, beyond the demonstration the attract mode of the game like see all of those like levels. And I think that's that's part of what the reason I chose it. But I chose it also because um, you know the year 1200 I knew could probably could do it at the time as well. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be honest about super sprints. It was um, it was more of a case I'm just absolutely crap on maths, and I just wanted to get better at maths. <laughs> and so I thought I'll do a bit of a challenge and just see if I can um, just learn a bit more about you know cosine, sine, and trigonometry that type of thing. And it just it just sort of like it turned out into a into a game. But you know I'm better I'm better for it. I'm doing more bit, a bit of maths now. And um, it's all because you know I, I can you know you see some. The biggest things like um, you're well you know, for the demo side, absolutely brilliant. And um, you know, if you were to ask us to code like a spinning cube or some other like a JN inspector or anything like that, I couldn't do it. Um, but if you ask me to code a game, I can't. I can. um, and, and you know, Devil's Temple had started out as a, a, as a port of Kung Fu Master. And you know, one, one, of, the, one of the challenges that, that you have, well, certainly I've had, is that you know, it's hard to get a graphics artist to kind of commit. To say, right, I'm going to draw you a whole new set of tiles, a whole new set of sprites, and um, for a game that you haven't really coded yet, um, unless you've kind of got that back catalogue of, of sort of like, right, well, you've done an arcade port, you've done an arcade port, you've done an arcade port, right, right. and then you kind of, and then I started on Kung Fu Masters, doing, doing that one, and then I had like a guy come to us, and he, he, you know, he's, he's from Canada, but it's a lot of potential. Absolutely loves the new J by the way. So. Um, and he, uh, he says, oh, he says, can I, can I just redo the, redo the tiles for you and redo the graphics for the game and you know, make it look much better. And, you know, within like, I think probably a week, you know, he came back with like the first, the first level of the game and I was like, I was just blown away. And I says, yeah, let's, let's make the game, but not make a come film master. And he had, you know, a lot of influence. I, I, I've never really played Vigilante, but he had, Brad had played a lot of come film master. I remember it sort of like in the arcade, being still next to our type in Nemesis, so you know, I, I can almost picture it. Um, so that was that, that was the reason we really. we just wanted to make an improved version of, of Kung Fu Master with a touch of vigilante. So that's why it's got the you know the like the knives and the and the, the nunchucks and stuff like that we put in the game. Yeah. I was lucky enough. I was doing it there. Uh, once they were sitting there yourself and have us playing there with Stemble and a couple of guys says, what is that an update? What's that one mate? And I'm like, I need a 1200. But no way, I mean, I can blow your socks off. It's so, so good. One for you, uh, Michael. Um, Zero Crisis is obviously heavily inspired by Robotron with a side selling of uh, Smash TV, Garnish with a drizzle line of uh, Alien Syndrome. Um, would that be anything that this genre was a particular favourite of yours? And can I also ask what challenges did you have converting this game to run on, I think, was it Switch, Neo Geo, Mega Drive, etc, etc? Um, yeah, so I was, I was a fan of Smash TV and, and Berserk, Graptron and Alien Syndrome and uh, yeah, also Mercs and Shock Troopers. Uh, so, yeah, we noticed that the uh, Mega Drive didn't really have a great arena shooter. Uh, the Smash TV version of the Mega Drive was a bit weak, we thought. So um, we came up with a, a control scheme which we thought would work on the three button pad and also the six button pad. And uh, yeah, we threw it in uh, Aliens Aesthetic, and uh, the game was born pretty much. You know, it kind of wrote it itself. And so it wasn't too, too difficult a game to make, to be honest. <laughs> Went too many challenges. Um, the biggest challenge is probably getting the controls away from the three button make throw pad. Uh, but yeah, converting to Neo Geo, it was the same resolution. Uh, Neo Geo can handle more colours, of course, so the art um, pulled it up across nicely. Um, and then, yeah, getting on the Switch, um, yeah, we did have to have two uh, different code bases actually. So we had like a retro code base, C and uh, Assembler, and then a modern code base, which is uh, written in hacks. <coughs> So our hacks engine actually ties in with Unity and that lets us spit out to PlayStation 4, Switch and so on. So um, yeah, it's a fairly easy process, but we want to move away from having two code bases because yeah, if you find a bug in one code base, you might have to go fix it in the other one and it's, it's, yeah, it's just awkward. So um, 
So yeah, moving forward, we're just have one one code base that spits out to every platform you can think of, pretty much, and uh, yeah, a few more. <laughs> yeah. Same question to yourself, eh? Ali. Obviously, you released games on Leave on the uh, NES, Sega Dreamcast, uh, Steam, and the Switch. Same question to yourself. What do you find? Do you have any particular issues when you can import from different systems, or can you wait for one platform? And is there some piece of can you take or is it where it automatically ports it? Hey, well, say I used like uh, NES Maker for Fleet, and then we, we did uh, Take Part in C. So take part easier to port out like, without emulation, uh, and then everywhere else we, we basically emulate. Like, uh, like the reason uh, it's on Dreamcast is because I remember like on the bus home from school, my mate gave me a CD with a bunch of NES games on it. There, uh, and I was like, that that exists and that's open source. Can we can we modify that so that we can make it like a, a different product uh, later on? And uh, I, yeah, I know some cool Cody friends are doing Dreamcast stuff. Uh, and he, he made that work. Uh, so that, that's how that did it. And then get over it, Switch and Xbox and PlayStation and all that stuff. That was, again, just emulation, uh, open source emulator uh, through a, a third party place, so I didn't have to touch it. Uh, I'm not the best coder, but I definitely could have done that without yeah, relying on other people. Uh, thank you. That's okay. <laughs> was another question? Oh, that was that. Was that? <laughs> Is it any or not? Uh, Daniel, am I right thinking that your sole, uh, you see, you publish games, is it just for the sake of Dreamcast? And again, what I think you touched on in all is your currently, currently, so you're looking to branch out. We are looking to branch out. <laughs> Dreamcast has been awesome, it's my favourite system. We're not going to stop supporting the Dreamcast, we're going to keep going. We've got, I think we've got 4 slash 5 ready for next year already. Um, but we want to put some, some original Game Boy games out. Uh, there's a lot going on in that scene, that's right in the front row, we'll be able to test to. Uh, a lot more than people robots, actually. Um, so it goes for the dream, actually. I'd say there's probably 20 to 30 games every year which are being put out. Not all getting commercial releases, but uh, there's a lot, lot happening. Um, we've been working on some play date stuff as well. Um, I think Alice there has too. Um, really, really cool system which not many people have yet, but um, play date. It's like a yeah. Alistair's got one. <laughs> yeah. It's um. I kind of see it almost as like a modern version of the original Game Boy. It's got a black and white screen. It's got A and B and a D-pad, and that's it. Um, and a crank, which you and a periscope. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. Okay. It's got a bunch of extra stuff. <laughs> if you can make a Game Boy game, you can make a play date thing. So can I ask you lads, uh, did any of you guys code uh, a sort of professional basis or, uh, because let's be honest, uh, <coughs> you're coding at a rather more mature age. Um, is this your first four year to code? Do you have a chance to back up? Battle stuff, you mean? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm back when I left school, I, I mean, I had aspirations to be a games department and um, there was a there was a, uh, a software house at them games um, at the time where they where I lived. And um, when I left when I left school, the, the, I had like a YTS game, um, and I got like a placement on a on a YTS. I think it's twenty nine fifty a week. And I think if you got through that, you you went like the thirty five pound a week. And um, so I, I went into this like tech placement, and you know the, I was I was telling the. I forget who it was to, to, to say, oh, can you, can you get me some placements in, like, in the games companies? And so I ended up, um, ended up at Zeppelin Games and, uh, you know, they were paying me, you know, 29 50 at the time. And uh, the, the guy, the guy who was late, he said, right, we just sit in the corner. And I said, right, I, I program like the Mega Games. And he says, well, there's a Commodore 64, just start programming that and make me a Kung, make me a Kung Fu game. And I was like, right, okay. So, and bear in mind, I wasn't very, very good at actually programming, and I didn't have the resilience or the, you know, the um, determination, I guess, at that young age. And um, so, about three months went past, and uh, you know, I tried my best to learn 6502, um, and you know, we, uh, he 
he came in, had a look at the code, and he thought, yeah, I'll extend you for another three months. Because he obviously wasn't paying any decent wage for us, so he sort of like, um, you know, he, he, he could do that. But after the six months, he sort of, he had a look, and I, the game was really bad, by the way, when I, when I finished it on the C64. Um, and it's, uh, he said, oh, yeah, you're pretty good, but, you know, we've got to let you go type of thing. Um, and that, that was kind of the, that was kind of the sort of like area where I had to get a job at, you know, you know I, needed, I needed some money, so I ended up going in like in the general IT. Um, but that's really the only time that I've, that I've worked in the, I guess, in the games industry. And, you know, to, to be fair, um, I don't know what it's like now, I would imagine it's a lot better now, but, you know, it was like a room, just a small room with like developers all like packed in. Um, you know, and what, what, what was strange was, was like at the, at sort of like lunchtime, they'd, they'd all sort of like pack up like deep games and uh, stop what we were doing coding and then pull out sort of like pirated versions of like sensible soccer and start playing that for like a, for an hour. It was, it was so weird and then, you know, then they'd start back up again. But yeah, um, it was, I was a bit gutted I didn't get the, get the carry on, but you know, it, it ended up all right. I've, I've, I've made the games now, which is, which is good. In short, no. I've never been paid for my code, for good reason. Uh, I've been a web developer for 10 years, so you know that world is, is familiar to me, but yeah, as far as programming uh, commercially for video games, no, not at all. Yeah, I mean, I'm more of an artist, uh, so not so much the coding. I, I, I code enough uh, that I'm dangerous. Uh, I, I can prototype uh, friendly, but like, then I for as long as I. Do you only know Fs? Like, yes. That's <laughs> <laughs> Just F-coding, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I've, I've, I've been learning a lot more on the Blade Games, and I'm really enjoying that at the moment. Uh, but yeah, all, all the old stuff is way with my head, and uh, yeah, anything to pick up for us is I've been paid for it, actually. Uh, technically, uh, I, I wrote the, the camera scrolling system for uh, the game Red Rain on uh, Apple Arcade uh, because I, I was over in a different studio in New Zealand and they were like, can you do that? They don't usually trust me with code in the uh, Dundee office, but I'll try. <laughs> and I did, and I did make it for the game, which is good. But I also did have a big bug that crashed, and so they, they didn't, uh, they, they fixed one of the lines, but... Uh, yeah, but I, I, I was paid as an artist for, uh, for, for many years. Um, yeah, so I started as a QA tester at 19, back in 95, working for SCI. I um, managed to get into level design. Um, uh, then I hit Hunter, then went to uh, IMO. Sorry, no, we were, we were called IO Productions, actually, uh, based in Eastley. We were making a, a sheet padding game for the Dreamcast. So I was heavily on the design on that. Uh, that was still with Flash. And um, yeah, from Flash, uh, I got into Hacks, which is yeah, it's a nice transition really. Um, so yeah, um, I don't really class myself as a, a good programmer, but I'm more of a designer programmer. Um, but yeah, I've, I've, you can say I've been programming for 24 years, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I must be doing something right, but um, yeah, I'm not the best. But uh, luckily I've worked with some very clever people who do all the difficult stuff for them. Obviously, you can code for any old systems. Do you think you'll ever branch any modern systems at all? Or are you pretty happy to stick old systems and, you know, be, be you look at Z81 processor, you can get Z81 process to that? I'll taste the coding skills. Yeah, go for it, yeah. Um, short answer, no. I've um, not, not really got any interest in the modern, the modern systems. Um, yeah. Uh, it's like I said earlier, the, 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 I don't know where the boundary is, and I, I like those technical limitations of really, um, working on the older systems. Might, you know, later on I might double in the C64 and, and, and finish that Kung Fu again. Um, apart from that, short answer from that. Uh, yes, to a degree. Um, there's a bunch of games that we've put out that people are now asking for like modern versions of, which will essentially just be ports or... Um, <laughs> Likely not emulation, uh, it would have to be bots, um, but that would be the only goal that um, I can see us having with the modern systems. Basically putting modern retro games onto new systems.
Uh, yeah, I, I do really like the, the, the kind of cutting edge stuff, but I, I really don't like for, uh, uh, for the fact that I don't think we're actually there yet. I, I don't want to deal with it until it's actually there. And then when it is there, I think it'll be really boring. So I, I just, I, I'm not interested. Uh, so I, I really like, like artistic type games and stuff, like artistic rendering, like uh, non core artistic stuff. Uh, and the, the power that we've got to do cool shader graphs and stuff is, is really good right now. So yeah, I, I think I, I would like to do more of that stuff. But again, the, the retro thing is like a good niche to, to kind of like, get your name going and then uh, kind of scaling up for that. I won't forget about the retro, I definitely won't do a lot of it. <laughs> but, yeah, I do like the new stuff. Uh, yeah, so we're putting all of our titles onto modern platforms still and we'll continue to do that. Yeah, I think a great game is uh, a great game irrespective of the platform, the platform really. So if you make a great NES or Mega Drive game that you know, people will still want to play on the Switch or the PS5 or whatever, um, one avenue we won't be going down is uh, probably VR or NFTs or crypto or any of that stuff. So we just want to keep it. Uh, very old school. Um, so yeah, I think uh, we'll yeah we'll continue supporting whatever whatever comes next. Um, as long as you can push buttons to make things happen on the screen, that's that's all we need. We've got tons more questions, but I kind of run out of time. I want to open the, the, the floor for any questions. One last one for you guys. Uh, I mean, modern games require like hundreds of hours of investment of time. You need the dexterity I mean, it's now of an ambidextrous octopus to control most games. Do you think the simplicity of these games has like, a huge appeal to the modern game or something? Um, yeah, I think so. I think, um, I, I, mean, I, I like games that just be open and play, um, like from the arcades, you know, just pick them up, have a game, and then get back what, what I'm still doing. Yeah, I think it's a really good game, like, and then get back to what I'm still doing. Um, seeing that, you know, um, the boy likes sport, like so I'll start playing Fortnite. Um, but yeah, I like, I like, I like just the, the simplicity um, element of the games. So, what's the question? Um, yeah, do you think that the fact that uh, you know, the that these are sort of simple, just like a play, and there's no massive thousands of buttons, do you think that's I think it depends on the game, doesn't it? I mean, you've got people that are really into like, uh, like MMO RPGs, for example. They're not going to like what we do, but those that grew up with these type of games, generally, they're going to. Especially as a lot of them are influenced by popular games at the time, um, some of which never got home ports. That's kind of one of the uh, one of it's kind of the genesis of some of these games. Is there was no home version of a particular arcade game, so someone decided to make it. Um, we've been to a few events like Play, which are um, more aimed at the modern crowd. We definitely don't do as well, so from that, from that perspective, they're looking for Flash, they're looking for you know, the Magic and Sparkle, which I, I think that we do get from Retro, but those particular people, it's just not for them. Uh, yeah, I, I really do like the simplicity of the old systems. Uh, like the NES controller in my mind is like the best controller. You've got two buttons <laughs> and a D pad. Uh, and I, th I think it's generational as well because the people that grew up our age, if they weren't playing games, they kind of didn't get used to that right analog stick. And we take it for granted that like everybody just knows how to do that. But the, there's so many people that have been like alienated because they've been told there's like crap or whatever. Uh, and then they, they just put that way and they play Candy Crush rather than that. But they, they, they don't see themselves as a gamer because of that. Uh, and, but I think that the modern generation growing up have kind of got that next area in the right hand. And it, like, me being uh, dyspraxic, I found it really, really hard to, to get used to that. I, I absolutely hated those games for a long time myself. Uh, but it, it became standardised like, uh, around the, the 360 era uh, where uh, this is how you do camera controls. And then, I actually was like, cool, but I don't need to relearn this for every game. The simplicity is really good to go back to children that haven't got to the stage of using the dual animal stars and have really like connected with the old NES games. I've heard a few people in the crowd say that to me. Four year olds playing a team work and love it. It's the truth. Yeah, I mean, for me, the appeal is just being able to sort of turn on the console and just immediately start playing the game. Um, when I had my PS3, every time I turned it on, there'd be a system update, or the controller wasn't charged, or 
we're going to need to update it. <laughs> yeah, if you've got just like half an hour or an hour, that's, that's a lot of us doing just to play a game. It's, um, you know, that's, that's, that's your whole session gone. So, so yeah, I, I think um, it's great that you can just slap the game and just, just play it. And, and you know you've got the whole game there as well, there's no DLC or microtransactions. So, um, yeah, I'm looking for it. But hopefully, uh, it's still on the Wikipedia script for a few more years yet. Yeah. Okay, guys, I'm just going to open up to the floor. The wonderful Colin is going to be in the way with him. Can you just raise your hand? Obviously, I've not got another microphone, so you'll need to be vigilant, Colin. Right. Hi. So, apart from the games that you guys have all made, what kind of recommendations would you give to people who want to get into homebrew? Like, what, what are some of your favourite games that you've played for various retro systems? Uh, do, do you mean from like a technical perspective, uh, so you want to get into programming? Or? Uh, yeah, from both perspectives, for programming or for people that want to play the games, what's a good one to get into to look at homebrew in general? I mean, from a, from a technical perspective, I mean, there's loads of tutorial stuff, you know, if you want to carry on these. My, my channel has some um, tutorials. Again, the program that gives you like a, a, a baseline to get into it. Um, and to be, to be fair, the program, you know, if you put the game against the Amiga and Assembler, it's, it's quite, <laughs> it's, quite um, it's quite difficult at first, but once you get over that, it's, it's quite, you know, you, well, certainly for me, you, you, you can kind of push off. Is that okay? Yeah. For the Dreamcast, um, there's, there's a really great engine which is open source, which I recommend checking out. It's called Simulant. There's a Discord as well. Um, it makes developing the Dreamcast a lot easier. I know Dreamcast isn't going to be for everyone, but if that's something that anyone's interested, that's the way to go. Um, so, were you looking for recommendations of sort of homebrew games, essentially? Yeah, games as well. Okay, and well, obviously all of ours. <laughs> Apart from the ones you guys have already made. Okay. Um, <laughs> Xeno Crisis is my personal favourite, <laughs> and, that's, and that's, that, that's genuine, it's not just because he's here. It's um, it properly. It's absolutely <laughs> amazing. Yeah, she, there you go. Um, and you can buy it on everything. Yeah, it's on, it's on every platform. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's a hard question because basically every game that I find that I like, I approach them and say, can I publish this please? <laughs> so we've either published it or we're going to publish it. Um, uh, yeah, I'll just say Xeno Crisis for now. Slight accent, maybe. Micromedius is one I realized. Okay. Uh, that was the other one that was like, the big research and said the next whole brew season, I think. Uh, and then <coughs> Dungeons and Noon Nights, that was really good as well. It came out recently. Uh, slow Mold is really, really hard. Uh, so it plays my heart quite quickly. Uh, and yeah, new stuff like Nestmaker, GB Studio. GB Studio is getting so much better because it's open source. Uh, I wish Nestmaker would go that way because it's a horrible clunky interface. You know, it's just really hard. Um, yeah, what else? Nebs and Debs. Uh, listen to the, the Homebrew, no, the NES Assembly podcast. You want to see the uh, Homebrew stuff. Or uh, Retro Break Channel as <laughs> well. Um. Yeah, I quite, I quite uh, enjoy NG Dev Team's output. Um, yeah, they, they make some very polished NGO stuff. Uh, Matt Phillips is uh, tank board is excellent too. That's worth it. Um, yeah, Mike Major is uh, yeah great stuff. Um, and yeah, I mean Intrepid Lizzy looks cool. Yeah, so <laughs> look at what's cool Lizzy as well. So, um, yeah, yeah, there's, there's so many, there's so much great. Um, Homebrew stuff coming up on so many platforms now. Um, uh, and yeah, the NG Dev Team stuff, yeah, the NGO is very expensive, so we're not the best recommendation, but uh, you can check it out on YouTube. It's a very nice way to look at their stuff. Good point about NG Dev Team, by the way. They make uh, Dreamcast stuff as well. Um, and I think it's pretty much straightforward, so they're, they're great too. Just, uh, just a quick shout out to the Amiga as well. There's a good engine um, being developed by Amiga called Scorpion Engines. Really easy to get in the making games and space and good games come out um, using that engine. And um, so we'll have one Scorpion Engine. Just 
Ich glaube, man hat eine Do you want us to show you the glitch or do you actually have that sort of thing? If you want to play your games when you don't have the hardware, um, you don't know where to get your games from, what's the easiest way to, to actually get access to them? You can run emulators or can you download them from a website? Um, well, yeah, so my, my game specifically uh, is available on uh, for an itch page. Uh, it's going to be easy itch uh, All my games are along there. Yes, you can, and then somebody will make a glimpse of you can run an emulation. Um, so the best emulator to, to, to run it, my game's on is Win U80. Uh, it's constantly developed, but they'll, they should run on FSU80. I'll have a bit of a nightmare. <laughs> um, so yeah, you, you know, there's some really good, couple of good Amiga emulators I'll, I'll run my game, so no, no problem. Um, if you want a box, box edition of the game, and we go to gazinggames.co.uk and um, we can get the limited box room that the shoes we get. That's an excellent question, because there's a lot of people that like this kind of thing that don't have a Dreamcast. Um, and they're becoming harder to get hold of uh, with working disk drives as well, so that's a really important factor. Um, everything that we put out works perfectly in Redream, RE Dream emulator. Um, so that's what I would personally recommend. Always best on original hardware if you can, but uh, yeah, they work wonderful. Uh, yeah, emulators, uh, the NES games, Metin is the best emulator at the moment, uh, as far as we know. Uh, it supports them, but, like, all the new mappers as well. Uh, and we also, you, you can get uh, tapeworm basically everywhere as well. Uh, it's on Xbox, PlayStation, uh, Parasite Pack. It's like a free and tapeworm together for six clicks on all modern systems. And if you buy the PlayStation 1, you get a cross by PS4, PS5, and they've both got a platinum trophy. So there you go, and you can get a platinum 15 minutes if you're good. Yeah, we've got a great shop actually where you can uh, buy all, all of our products. Um, with, uh, pretty quick shipping actually for our ship quest. Um, and yeah, they're also, they're also on Switch and PlayStation, Xbox, etc. Um, you know, you can also swap the wrong if you have to, or buy a cheap Chinese knockoff there and play the laser around that, which is a bit annoying, but um, yeah, yeah, we're trying to hit as many platforms as we can. Actually, Nintendo Crisis is coming to Nintendo 64 and PlayStation 1 next as well, so it should open up the game to a few more people, hopefully. We think you're at like, what, 16 or 17 platforms, but yeah, catch I don't catch think those guys <laughs> I probably should mention where you can get our games from. Uh, we could, so we're, just a reminder, we're with Wave Game Studios. So our website is wavegamestudios.com. We're also open on all the social medias. Um, however, we do make a very, very conscious effort to make sure that our games are available in as many independent retro game retailers as possible. We're in around about 60 at the moment, which is approximately half. Um, there's one very near here. Um, I can't remember the name right now, unfortunately. Hard to keep 120 retailers in your head. Um, but yeah, most, most independents will either stock us or know about us and get our stuff. I think we've got time for two more questions. Mr. Pete, one of the retro Squire? Um, obviously, like, the old systems, limited hardware, and your small teams. But do you find, just because they're new games, that people have unrealistic expectations of these games? Absolutely. The amount of times we've had people at conventions saying, um, this game's great, but it'd be really great if it was an on-screen map. And it's just not possible with the hardware. Um, the other thing is, because they're being made by one, one person, two people, maybe three, I think, yeah, I think three is the largest team that we've worked with. It's, it's unrealistic to expect certain features to be, to be in these games, unfortunately. Um, it's just a matter of time. Yeah, like feature creep is, is a real thing. Uh, like you've got all these ideas of what you want to go in the game, and then you don't get in with you know, whether it's uh, limitations of the hardware or uh, time and uh, time the same thing. But you say that's the sequel, that's what happened back in the day as well. Uh, but yeah, it, it, more so on, on the newer systems, uh, you get it when they're like, oh, this system's crap, like you know, the NES game running on the uh, Dreamcast. Like, why does it look like an SD? Because it is. And, and sometimes explaining that to people, you just don't get it. 
Um, yeah, I think there's, I think the new generation come through probably don't appreciate pixel art quite as much as, <laughs> as we do. So you get the odd comment uh, here and there, um, and your um, annoying Steam review. But yeah, to be honest, they're not really our audience. You know, uh, our audience are really in the early 50s now, <laughs> and it, we we try to cater for the young audience. And um, yeah, especially with difficult. You know, I've found that. Um, We've been making our games way too difficult and <laughs> we've had a lot of criticism about that. So um, yeah, we're, we're having to cater for the sort of more younger, more casual game with um, you know, difficulty, different difficulty modes. And yeah, finally with that, it's got a casual difficulty thing, which you know, that hurt me to put it there, but it has to be done. Um, so yeah, you have to make, um, you have to make uh, some sacrifices for you know, the modern audience, I guess. Yeah. It's cheaper anyway. Can we get one last question, please? Um, which game we've done that for the platform that you've got to see a full or a version of? Quite a question. Um, can I think about that in the past of Which game for our chosen platform, in my case, Dreamcast, would we like to see like, a, 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 new, a new version of? Or? Wow. Um, I'd like to see a new Virtua Cop. I know that it's a bit of, a bit of a niche choice these days, but that was one of my favourites. Um, yeah, I'll go with that. I can't think of one for the next, but I, I want a, a new good Prince Credit game. Because yeah. <laughs> Prince Credit on PS2, the, the San Antonio Rick was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> we told the story and stuff, like, you die and it explains it. No, no, that's not it. Uh, yeah. Along with just the thing bending the guy. Don't check the line before. The rematch was crap. A new game in that front end. Uh, it's <clears throat> Uh, I've discovered King's Bounty during lockdown, weirdly. Um, thanks to Snez Drunk, I think it was. Um, so me and my daughter played it back there. I'd love to see a new version of it. Well, I just want you all to put your hands together and give it up for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.